I create and curate immersive and interactive art, um, and I often work with scientists in order to do that. In 2020, many of us saw with horror just how deadly science denial could be. In the two years since then, it's only become even more apparent. When UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres visited flood-ravaged Pakistan recently, he said, I have seen many humanitarian disasters in the world, but I have never seen climate carnage on this scale. The deadly story of science denial has its origins in the 1950s uh, with the tobacco industry's attempts to deny the causal link that had been established between smoking and cancer. In December 1952, the Reader's Digest, then Americans, uh, the American public's leading source of medical information, published a widely read article called Cancer by the Carton, citing scientific evidence that smoking led to increased risk of lung cancer. Cigarette sales plummeted as a result. A year later, the heads of all the major tobacco companies met secretly in New York. Their purpose was to find a way to disrupt the link between smoking and cancer that had become established in the public mind or see their profits suffer. They cynically decided to manufacture controversy where there was none. They developed a plan of misinformation. They funded skeptics started health reassurance campaigns, ran adverts showing doctors smoking, and presented alternative explanations for lung cancer, such as pollution, asbestos, and pet birds. The Brown and Williamson Tobacco Company, now BAT, one of the biggest tobacco companies in the world, outlined their strategy as follows. Doubt is our product. Since it is the best means of competing with the body of fact that exists in the mind of the general public, what they were scared about was the public understanding of science, and they developed sophisticated techniques to undermine this. Their success led to over 100 million deaths in the last century alone. Manufactured controversy is created when general consensus among the scientific community is successfully challenged by special interest groups for a public audience. They claim uncertainty about widely accepted data or theories, and argue that legitimate dispute about them is being suppressed by the scientific community. This works best in cultures that identify as democracies since they claim to be promoting values that are shared by the scientific community and the public alike, such as free speech and academic freedom. After seeing how successful the tobacco companies were at deploying these techniques, the fossil fuel industry adopted and refined them to deadly effect when they became concerned that the general public was starting to make the connection between pollution and global warming, and they worried that regulation would affect their profits. After Exxon was briefed by its own scientists in 1977 that carbon dioxide pollution was leading to climate change, they took out a series of ads in the New York Times every Thursday from 1985 to 2004 under the banner Unsettled Science successfully sowing confusion amongst the general public. Marty Huffert, one of the Exxon scientists, recently said, I am pissed off. I am extremely angry. What they did was immoral. They spread doubt about the dangers of climate change when their own researchers were confirming what a threat it was. And as a result, homes and livelihoods were destroyed and lives lost. Science denial became political policy in 2002 when Republican Party pollster Frank Luntz urged Republican politicians to encourage the public in the view that there was no scientific consensus on the dangers of greenhouse gases. He told them, the scientific debate is closing against us but not yet closed. There is still a window of opportunity to challenge the science. Voters believe that there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. This approach has become the template for science denial, and it's something that Donald Trump perfectly understood as both a businessman and a media player, and has used to his considerable political and personal advantage. 
once politicized, it now became part of the culture wars with many Republican voters associating climate change scientists with socialists, intent on shutting down legitimate debate and challenging the free market. The playbook was already written and ready to roll when COVID-19 came along. Meanwhile, culture warriors and enemies of Western democracy are using the same techniques to erode trust in democratic institutions. It's quite clear that there's an overwhelming need to fight against this assault on science by increasing the body of fact that so terrifies corporate interests and enemies of democracy. However, a gulf separates scientists and the general public. There is an information gap that is being exploited by these bad actors. So what can we do about this? How can we close that gap? Traditionally, researchers are poor at communicating, at least in a way that the public understands. Often, they point to established facts underpinned by research to make their points. But these facts are easily qu questioned on uh, social media. A recent study by MIT scholars found that false news spreads more rapidly on social platforms than real news does, and by a substantial margin. I'm not convinced that social media is the right platform on which to do battle. Facts don't move people, but stories do. Only compassion beats division. Olivia Lang, author and essayist, described the power of art a couple of years ago when writing about its importance in turbulent political times. We're so often told that art can't really change anything, but I think it can. It shapes our ethical landscapes. It opens us to the interior lives of others. It is a training ground for possibility. It makes plain inequalities and it offers other ways of living. But art and science can seem light years apart. Science is objective, systematic, follows laws and seeks consensus, while art is subjective, emotional, aesthetic, and individualistic. But maybe the gap isn't really so wide after all. Science and art are both acts of creation. Each are an inquiry with the aim of helping us understand the world around us. Art can help us conceptualize complex ideas and visualize intricate systems. It can be a powerful tool for telling scientific stories. Art can allow us to encounter things invisible to the naked eye or so vast and distant that we can only travel there in our imagination. Art helps scientists understand the natural world and has the potential to inspire the next generation of scientists. I'm therefore proud to be heading up a new initiative which has as its aim to close that gap, the Zilberzelt Institute Innovation Labs. By bringing scientists together with producers of arts, entertainment and new media to explore innovative and accessible ways to express science, we aim to improve the impact and quality of scientific research on policymakers and the general public throughout Europe. The Innovation Labs are divided into three schools, each led by its own head of studies, arts and culture, immersive and interactive, and film. And the aim is to have six projects in each school. We're at the beginning of this journey. We will select the applicants of the open call in a couple of weeks uh, during Experimenta in Grenoble, an event that brings together artists and scientists, and where we can start matchmaking researchers with uh, some of the artists there. The matchmaking will continue at other European arts events until the end of the year, and then we'll start developing new concepts to pitch for funding and support during the Zilberzelt Science and Media Festival in Halle Zala in June. If you know any researchers who could be interested, we'll keep submissions open until we do the final selection on the 20th of October. So there's a short window of opportunity still open. And if you know any artists, filmmakers, or creative technologists who might be interested in working with one of the researchers to develop a new project together, let me know. If you're interested to see what the participants come up with, then join us at the Zilbers Arts Festival in Halle, which runs from the 21st to the 25th of June, 2023, where these new projects will be presented for the first time. I'd like to share with you some words about the potential of this program sent in by one of the applicants who said, as a child, I was mesmerized every time I watched David Attenborough and Jane Goodall documentaries. I looked up to them and they made me understand and appreciate the gifts of nature. Thus, I ended up becoming a scientist. I wish to have a similar impact on other people's lives and I believe that your institute has the capacity to help me learn and delve into the world of science and media produc uh, production. 
uh, like this applicant, I've got a huge amount of faith in this program, uh, since, as the great Albert Einstein said, the greatest scientists are always artists as well. Oh, okay, that's... <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm, I'm glad I didn't interrupt.